Because it's a it's complete. Okay. Awesome. Thank you so much, madam. I just have to Good morning, everybody. My name is Budge Courier, and I'm the chair of the 911 Advisory Board. Welcome to the Advisory Board meeting. Today is, what is it, May 15th. Uh, it's 10 o'clock, and uh, what I'm going to do is, is go through roll call to get us started. Um, thank you everybody, to members of the public that are present. Uh, we've got a good crowd in the room today, so it's exciting for us. All right, so I'm going to move to roll call, and... Um, what I'm going to do, I know there's a couple of members that are participating remotely, which is allowable, but there are a couple of things that I'll need you to do when I get to your name in the roll call. You'll need to disclose that you are remote, which will be quite obvious when we hear your voice across the speakers, but you still have to disclose that. Um, you'll have to make sure your camera is on, and then you'll have to declare if there's anyone over the age of 18 in the room with you and um, their relationship to you. So if you're in a room by yourself, then just say, hey, I'm all by myself and you're good. Uh, we don't need their names or anything or your location. That's not required. Just need uh, those couple of details in there. All right, so let's move through the roll call. Uh, Chief Ellison. And we don't think he's online yet. All right. Uh, Kurt Wallace. Here. Mark Chase. We know he's en route due to traffic, so he'll be here soon. Sheriff Braun. All right, I think Sheriff Braun's on. We're not hearing her. Can you guys make sure there's no... Also, make sure everybody online can actually hear us. I see her picture on the screen, but I'm not hearing her voice. I can hear you online, Budge. All right. Rebecca Ramirez, we'll come back to Sheriff Braun. Uh, Rebecca Ramirez, and I'm in my vehicle right now. My, my video seems to be disabled, so I'm working on trying to get that uh, up and running. All right, so Sammy, can, can everybody online hear back? me, do you think? If anyone's online, if you can hear us, uh, come off mute and give us a quick sound check. Hey, right, Budge, this is Mike up in Reading. I hear you. You able to hear me, Budge? All right. I think we've got to validate that those online can hear us. So give us just a second. Budge, I can hear you. Uh, All right, Sheriff Braun, we can see you're online. If you could come off mute, and we just want to try and get an audio check with you.
Hi, Sammy. He expired in 2022. We didn't renew. I think hers might be coming up for renewal. Hers is a little newer than his, but he didn't. He didn't. So he's not been okay. All right. Little. If you're online, uh, you could, if you could go on mute, we can hear you. So you might want to. Go on mute. Um, we're trying to get a roll call from either uh, Chief Ramirez or Sheriff Braun. Okay, Sheriff Braun is here. Hey, thank you, Sheriff Braun. Appreciate All right, it. Good to hear right. you. I, I know we were having some issues on our side and uh, we've solved them. So thank you. Okay. All right. And um, can you just confirm that there's uh, if, if anyone over 18 is in the room with you? No, there's no one else in the room. All right. Thank you, Sheriff. OK. And uh, Chief Ramirez. Are you online? All right, Jennifer Gonzalez. Present. All right, thank you. Andrew White. Present. Thank you. Demetria Sidney. Present. All right, so that was a rather eventful roll call. Um, let's back up to uh, Chief Ellison. Did he come online yet? OK, so we do have a quorum, which is good news. Um, so and we've got one participating remotely. We will update you if any of the other members join, but we've established a quorum and we'll hit the easy button and, and let's move on. The meeting is officially underway. All right. Uh, item number two on the agenda, which I will advance the slides to, is uh, our meeting minutes. We had our meeting here at Sequoia Pacific in February. Uh, Sammy sent those meeting minutes out to everybody. Does anybody have any edits or addition to the meeting minutes from the board? Seeing, hearing none. Uh, do we have a motion to approve the minutes? So move, Gonzalez. All right, we have a motion from Chief Gonzalez and a little bit of feedback. You might want to, mics are a little hot. Uh, do we have a second? White, second. Uh, second from Chief White. All right, and I have to do a roll call on this. So. We'll run through the uh, roll call. We know that Mark is not yet available. Uh, Chief White. Approved. Uh, Kurt Wallace. Sheriff Braun. Uh, abstain. I wasn't at that meeting. All right. And let's see. Amitrius. Approved. And Chief Gonzalez. Approved. All right. Motion carries. Thank you. Moving on, our next agenda item is uh, closed session. And we did have, if you recall, at the end of the previous meeting, uh, one of our board members requested we go into closed session to discuss an outage. That board member is stuck in Bay Area traffic. Um, those of you that live in the Bay Area are nodding your head right now going yes, indeed. So we're going to take that item out of order and we'll come back to agenda item number three and go into closed session. Uh, provided some things happen that enable us to do that. There's a procedure for that that uh, Melanie has advised me of, and I think I've got in hand and I printed out a sheet to help me. So I think we're going to be good there. So we're going to move on to agenda item number four. Uh, I believe we have a representative from Cal OES Legislative and External Affairs on the phone. Oh, you're in the room. Well, thank you. I thought, yeah. All right. Well, the, the mic is yours. Please take it away, sir. Great, thank you, Budge. Uh, Paul McGinnis with uh, Legislative Affairs. Uh, happy to be given an update this morning. Uh, just a couple quick notes before I get into a few uh, state and federal bills. Um, on April 8th, we had a, a new deputy director sworn in for our office, Bridget Kolakowski. Um, she is uh, coming to us from um, agency as well as uh, 16 years in the legislature. So we're happy to have her on board. Um, also a couple key legislative uh, dates to keep in mind as we're moving through the session here. Uh, May 24th is the last day uh, each house um, for the for each house to pass bills that are introduced in that house. And then August 31st is going to be the last day for the legislature to pass all bills to the governor's desk. September 30th is the last day for the governor to act on all bills that are put on his desk. So just a few dates to keep in mind. Um, I'll now get into uh, 
a few updates on uh, state and federal bills. I think it's about six state bills and three federal bills. So bear with me here as I get into them. Uh, first is AB uh, 1863. Uh, this bill uh, revises how and when the CHP uh, must issue a feather alert. A feather alert can be issued if um, law enforcement agency determines that specified criteria are satisfied with uh, with respect to an endangered indigenous person who has been reported missing under explained or sus suspicious circumstances. Uh, that bill's in appropriations right now. A lot of a lot of these bills are going to be in the appropriations committee. Um, they suspense hearing for the first house is tomorrow. So that's where a lot of these bills are at. Uh, next, AB 2765. Uh, this bill would require the, the CPUC to develop and implement rules uh, to conduct random annual facility checks to verify that providers of telecommunications service are in compliance with their plans submitted to and approved by the Commission regarding backup electricity for telecommunications infrastructure. Again, that was AB 2765, and that bill is also um, in the Assembly Appropriations Committee. Next, AB uh, 3020, the 211 Infrastructure Act uh, would, upon appropriation, require OPR, Office of Planning and Research, to establish and convene the 211 Strategic Advisory Committee. Uh, the bill would require the committee to be composed of specified members, including directors of specified state agencies, um, also to include the, the Cal OES director. That's also in appropriations. Uh, next bill I wanted to share um, with the board, AB 3020, or I'm sorry, AB 3090. Uh, this one would authorize and encourage a public water system when updating an emergency notification plan to provide notification to water users by means of other communications technology, including but not li limited to text messages, email, or social media. This one's in the Senate uh, before the Envi Environmental Quality Committee. Um, two more state bills to share. SB 1003 uh, would require electrical corporations to take into account both the need to minimize the risk of catastrophic wildfire as soon as possible and the amount of risk addressed for the cost of proposed mitigation within the utilities wildfire mitigation plan. Um, SB 1003 is also um, on appropriations committee. Then last for the state bills, but not least, SB 1220. Uh, this bill would prohibit state and local agencies that are authorized to provide or enter into contracts relating to public benefits programs, which would include 211 and 988 services, from contracting with out of state call centers and re uh, restricts the use of AI and automated decision systems that eliminate or automate the core job functions of a worker. Those are the state bills. I, I also wanted to share uh, very briefly here three federal bills that we're tracking um, in the realm of telecommunications. <clears throat> um, HR 498 is the uh, 988 Lifeline Cybersecurity Responsibility Act, uh, would require the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration to undertake efforts to protect the 988 Suicide and Crisis Lifeline from cyber threats. Last action on that bill is March 2024. Uh, next is HR 1353. Uh, this bill requires the FCC to facilitate the provision of emergency communication services, including 911 calls and emergency alerts in unserved areas. Uh, it, is, it, def uh, it defines an unserved area as one that has no commercial mobile service capable of providing emergency services because of lack of infrastructure, destruction of infrastructure, a power outage, or other reasons. Then lastly, HR 7043 uh, would direct the FCC to issue reports after activation of the Disaster Information Reporting System, or DERS, um, and would make improvements to network outage reporting and also for other purposes. And that was introduced in January of 2024. And that completes uh, the legislative update for this morning. 
happy to answer any questions if there are any, but barring that, it's end of the report. Thank you. All right, thank you, Paul, for that update. Do we have any questions from the board? Chief White, go ahead. Can you repeat the number of the one banning the out of state uh, answering? Oh yeah, that's SB 1220. Thank you. No problem. All right, any other questions from the board? Go ahead, Chief. And if you can repeat the second to the last number, 1553, HR 15. Was that the, uh, the federal bill? It's the emergency alert, unserved areas. Yeah, 1353. 13, thank you. HR, yeah, no problem. All right, any other questions from the board? All right, any questions from the public on agenda item number four? All right, thank you, sir. Appreciate the brief. And what we'll do is uh, we will send that list out to uh, the board members just to make sure that you all have that. Um, so you'll, you'll get a rundown of those as well. Okay, moving on to agenda item number five. I'll invite uh, Paul Troxell up to give us an update. Um, you're probably going to want this clicker. Unless you want to keep telling me next slide, next slide, next slide. Um, so he's going to give an update um, on some items that the branch is tracking. Obviously, uh, really encourage the board to interact, ask questions. There's a lot going on. Um, so we're going to provide some high level overview of, of what's happening, but ha happy to dig in at any time uh, to get some insight on what's been going on in the 911 branch. Uh, Mr. Trox, so take it away, please. Uh, thank you. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Uh, as Bud said, we've got a lot going on and we've got some good news to share with the advisory board. Uh, here's some of the topics that we'll be discussing in our brief uh, this morning. Uh, first thing I want to do is go into our legacy outage uh, report for the first quarter 2024. Um, here is the 911 network outage uh, report. No, notice um, February and March were pretty significant numbers. Uh, when the team dug into that, what we found is the storms in Southern California uh, overwhelmed the legacy network. Uh, especially that network that was underground. Uh, we had a lot of the uh, copper wire um, that the conduit or copper got um, saturated and uh, went offline. So um, February, March, that was the reason for um, some of that increase. And as uh, we brief out some of the good news stories, <clears throat> we have uh, a significant outage around the CSULA area. Um, some of those outage numbers um, are as a result of some copper theft. Um, so we've got a good news story coming with uh, CSULA. So please remember these numbers as we brief that shortly. For CPE outages, uh, we did have a small spike in February. Um, we, we haven't been able to analyze and get exact details of why that spike occurred. However, January and March do appear to be uh, averaging out uh, what we would uh, C as normal outages with CPE. And then our uh, alley uh, numbers, uh, we do have a significant spike again in February. We believe that is all related back to um, the weather in Southern California. Again, this is for legacy alley, and we are transitioning to next gen alley. So although these numbers are large, um, there were very few PSAPs still on, on that legacy alley circuit. I'll take a quick pause here for the legacy outage report. Does anybody have any questions? Okay. For our next gen outage, <clears throat> for aggregation, uh, we are still not seeing any outages. Uh, service is able to get into the network. Uh, for our core, uh, the same thing as we've designed this network. If one of our region vendors has a failure or prime network vendor has a failure, the system is supposed to roll over and the calls will still be delivered. And when we take a look at these outage numbers, as long as there's no disruption to service, if failover worked as, as designed, we don't see that as a service disruption. For location uh, outages, again, we're moving uh, from legacy alley delivery to the next gen alley delivery, the alley emulation service. So these numbers are starting to come up. Um, in February, we did have uh, a significant spike in location outage, and uh, we believe that is um, 
the um, the service uh, being installed um, may have gone offline at the PSAP or there may have been a network disruption delivering that service. And our vendors have been tracking those trouble tickets and making improvements on those services as we're moving forward. And then our network outage, again, the way this network was designed, we've got multiple um, network connections between the region and the prime. Um, we are not seeing service disruptive outage in network. We do have network that goes uh, online, offline, but the all of that network availability down to the PSAP or up through the core is available and calls are being delivered. And then lastly, for our next gen 911 uh, service disruption, uh, in January, we did see uh, 29 minutes of outage with uh, cloud based CPE uh, based on a, uh, a maintenance window. The uh, uh, maintenance window took CPE offline for 29 minutes. We've worked with that vendor. They've uh, made a correction in their maintenance process, and we're not seeing any other disruptions for the la last quarter. I'll take a quick pause for any questions. Yeah, just a couple questions. So in March, then there were there were no alley outages in next gen 911 about how many PSAPs are online. And I don't know the answer to that question, so don't think it's a loaded question. I, I literally don't know how many we've transitioned. So the Andrew Okay, about 350. Yeah, so 350 PSAPs online with locations, zero seconds of outage. You compare that to previous months when there were thousands of minutes of outages for uh, locations. So we we promise that if it's going to be more resilient. I mean, that, that number right there is exactly yeah. compared to legacy is what. So good news and, and you know, good work to the team and to the vendors that are supporting that. I mean, that's yeah. that's that's what we're working towards. Right. So. Nice job there. And I, I do want to comment on that. It, what I see from our perspective is good news. The PSAPs are getting uh, more involved in the trouble ticketing process. They're learning that process because it is different, like a C to next gen. Um, so there was a learning curve there. The vendors had a learning curve trying to understand what services were live at what PSAPs. Um, they're all moving and getting successful. So we see improvement in the overall process here. All right, and uh, is there, there's a question online. All right, we'll go to the question from the public in just a second. Oh, it's, it's one of the board members. All right, go ahead online with your question. I just wanted to announce my participation in the way that you had asked, Budge. Uh, would you like me to go ahead with it? This is Rebecca yeah. Ramirez. Yeah, Chief Ramirez, go ahead. Uh, she just joined us online. So, yeah, just want to confirm you are online, which we now know, uh, and um, that there's no one over the age, if there's anyone over the age of 18 in the room with you. There is no one with me in this room. Thank you. All right. Wonderful. Thank you very much. And also, for the record, uh, Mark Chase has joined us in person. You're looking mighty snappy, and thanks for joining us. Appreciate it. All right. So, uh, that brings our uh, just um, and did Chief Ellison show up online? You have to say okay, all right. So so we're still good. All right. Any other right. questions from the board on the uh, next gen nine one outages? Okay. Any questions from the public on on outages? So uh, we want to kind of close that out. And move to the next topic. Okay. Procedure. Right. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. So this is a placeholder slide, uh, just showing the continued workload that we're seeing in California. Last year, we closed out at uh, just over 26 million total calls. Uh, we are seeing a wireless still creeping up. We anticipate that will uh, continue to grow. Uh, text to 911, uh, we're just over 98,000 text to 911 right now. Um, so again, we continue to monitor this and um, we anticipate when we have NextGen fully deployed, these numbers will, will likely um, lower a little bit because we think some of the 911 workload is transfers and we anticipate uh, some of those transfers uh, being minimized with uh, geo routing. All right, now to some good news stories. Um, our next gen 911 deployment uh, at the last advisory board, we briefed out how the state was going through and we were going to do some pre-migration testing at all the PSAPs around the state 
and uh, we had a very specific cadence, a very specific testing schedule. We were going to go in, test. If the test wasn't successful, the PSAP would be moved into a remediation schedule, and we'd just go PSAP to PSAP. Um, as, as we were developing that workload and learning from what we had from our Tiger Team approach last summer, um, through discussions, we decided that we needed some additional help with this project. So the 911 branch, we developed a contract to bring on a, a vendor to help with the pro project management and analysis of, of the overall project. That contract was awarded to Prometheum One in partnership with 911 Authority. Um, and when we onboarded them, they they kind of came in as they want to sit in the back seat and watch what we're doing and then slowly moved to the passenger seat and eventually kicked us out of the driver's seat and said, OK, here's some feedback. Um, so we met um, probably six weeks ago uh, and they gave us some analysis and said. Here's a better way to approach this. Um, so the plan that they've developed is we're taking targeted areas in the state. Um, our first focus is in central region in Kern County area. Uh, we're doing some work in the LA region and southern region uh, with Lumen NGA in both LA and in uh, central. But the largest effort is in the Kern County PSAP area. Um, a part of this team, uh, Prometheum One, recommended that we have two teams. One does the work at the PSAPs that are ready or close to being ready, and they do all of that final testing and get them set to pre-migrate traffic. The second team is an advanced team that's going out, and they're working on that next wave of PSAPs that two or three weeks ahead of the pre-migration schedule, and they're making sure that they're getting ready. In some cases, that PSAP might not be perfectly ready, but that's, that first team will come in and make them perfect and ready to migrate traffic. So what the pre-migration team is doing, um, we're working with the, the region vendor, the prime vendor, and our CPE maintenance provider, along with the Cal OES and Prometheum One team. Our focus is on getting those PSAPs ready to migrate, clearing all testing and any trouble identified during testing. The um, the team is completing all testing as directed by OES and the Prometheum One team. Any failure identified, this is that first team out there. It, we're treating it as a live outage. That means they're getting their engineering team and their NOC team online. They're working through that outage right there on the conference bridge. If for some reason that outage can't be cleared at that time, they're creating a trouble ticket um, and then they're given um, 24 hours to get that fixed. If it can't be fixed within 24 hours, then we come up with a daily cadence of calls and we work through that until it can be fixed. And the ideal plan here is within two weeks of su successful testing, we want carriers uh, brought on board to start migrating traffic. Then that, that second team, that PSAP readiness team, Again, working with the, re the region, the prime and our CPE maintenance provider, they're going out and going through all of that operational readiness testing and some of the pre-migration testing. They're identifying any uh, issues. They're creating trouble tickets. Prometheum One is tracking all of those trouble tickets and making sure the appropriate vendor is engaged and following up and getting that completed. The big benefit here in really where we're seeing success is instead of moving that PSAP that didn't pass testing into a later schedule for retesting, as soon as that trouble ticket's cleared, they're immediately getting retested. And they're working through each of those trouble tickets um, to be a little bit more assertive in that testing and retesting process. Um, any issues that can't be resolved, um, will be identified. Uh, we expect them to be resolved within about a two week window. Um, and if they can't be, um, then again, we're creating a daily cadence on the call with all of the vendors to work through that trouble ticket. Um, and again, our ideal situation is to get them near ready if, if we can't get them fully ready for that first team to come through and start migrating traffic. 
So as I identified in the central region, we're working with the Kern County area. If you remember our dashboard that we had, uh, that we still currently have on our um, OES website, the data is being tracked in there. Promethium 1 has a little bit more detail for us. We're trying to get that information uh, pushed out to our website as well. As of yesterday afternoon, we have nine PSAPs we're working in Kern County with. Four of them are ready to go. The other five are being actively tested and actively worked as, as we meet today. Um, the four that are ready have a conditional pass. We did see um, one issue come up as we're delivering uh, failover calls. So region vendor fails, that call gets routed through the prime network service provider down the PSAP. When the call uh, appears at CPE, uh, for some reason, CPE is not recognizing that as a call. Um, so we are working through that. Ryan and the engineering team are meeting with the region vendor, the prime vendor, uh, to work through um, resolution. Uh, we believe we have resolution delivered to us. We continue to test, and uh, Promethium 1 was tracking that today. Um, and uh, hopefully we'll have some report out either today or tomorrow for us on the success of, of that uh, fixed delivery. Once we get this condition cleared, we will start um, scheduling carrier migration. As we stand as of yesterday afternoon, we're looking that first week of June for carrier migration at these Kern County PSAPs. And um, for Southern, we're working uh, with a uh, small uh, group of uh, PSAPs. We probably are looking at uh, mid-June at this point uh, to start scheduling carrier cutover. As I identified during the outage brief uh, in LA, we have uh, CSU LA outside of their specific um, um, jurisdiction there. They've had a lot of copper theft, leading to a lot of outage. Uh, the team, the outage team working with the engineering team uh, started to talk about this and came up with an idea. If we can get that VoIP carrier who delivers the majority, over 80% of the 911 calls to CSULA, if we can get them migrated uh, through Autos, who, who uh, aggregates all of the VoIP traffic, then we mitigate all of the copper theft, and then everybody who wants to um, steal copper is not disrupting our 911 service. That's scheduled for tomorrow, so that's a huge story for us um, tomorrow afternoon. Uh, we expect CSULA to go online, uh, bringing in VoIP traffic, and I can't remember the, the VoIP carrier bandwidth, and it's like 83% of the calls, right? 87% of the calls for CSULA will be on the next-gen uh, network. Any questions about our updated deployment? <clears throat> A question regarding your pre-migration um, failures or outages that you're identifying during the, the beginning. Will those become statistics for the reporting that you're showing, or is that going to be a separate column down the road once you have that information, or will it not even show up? Um, I don't think we'll report those in the okay. outage because they're not service disrupting. When you speak to uh, carrier migration, has Tuolumne or Wasco, have you cut them 100% now? Uh, Tuolumne, I don't believe is 100% yet. I think we're still working with VoIP. Yeah. And then Wasco, uh, they went live with their CPE and they've successfully cleared the. Uh, pre-migration testing. So we have them, that are, they're one of the four for Kern County that will be migrated soon. Okay, so as far as when we say uh, carrier migration occurs, right? Can we just put a sort of a framework on that of if you've migrated one carrier, if it's T-Mobile or if it's Verizon or AT&T or whoever, um, we still don't have any PSAP that's 100% on fully migrated, correct? Is, isn't Imperial? There we no AT and T mobility is still pending in Imperial. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So you're asked, do you want us to report out who's live and who's not been 
migrated in the PSAP or the region? Well, so what is what is um, Cal OES? What does your office consider as success as far as when you say uh, you know carriers have been migrated? What's what what do you consider successful? When is is it just one carrier that's been migrated, or is is it a hundred percent of carriers? Or so the goal is a hundred percent. But success for me is getting a carrier live. Um, you know, again, we're focused on the wireless carriers. That's 87% of our workload. So the majority of the work going into PSAP is going to come from that, that wireless work. And what we're finding is um, the wireless carriers want to bring their traffic in. So for me, getting a wireless carrier on and getting a PSAP live, in this case, Kern County get these nine PSAPs live on next gen, defines our success. The ultimate goal is to get everybody migrated. Okay, and then as far as Tuolumne, you're, uh, my, my curiosity is right, because we talked about this at previous meetings. Once we encounter an issue right with landline, uh, traffic finally migrating and you know we're, we don't know what issues we're going to discover there so is there a timeline as for Tuolumne or Imperial as far as when they'll be 100 percent migrated onto next gen I think that work is uh, continuing on with autos right now right yeah so, I think one yeah. of the challenges there Mark is we've been told from the legacy selective router providers which are your main landline providers they want to go last and they haven't given us a timeline of when they're even willing to go so location is being delivered through next gen which is good news so it's just an audio switch over at that point quite trivial compared to the complex mobile you know all the mobile riders much more difficult to get right so we aren't anticipating anything but we've honored their request to let them go last um but as soon as we get all of the traffic off of a selective router then we will issue them a timeline as to when we will cut them over at some point we have to get into the driver's seat there. But to Paul's point, the success of getting a carrier live means that everything that we've designed, engineered, and programmed is working exactly the way we need to in this new environment. At that point, it just becomes a process to get all the carriers over. So we agree with you. We'll track that. Some PSAPs have 20 different carriers that you know terminate traffic into their PSAP. Tracking that gets really messy. We are tracking it, but providing a way to show in a graphic for 450 different PSAPs, the you know thousand different carriers that we're managing gets a little difficult for us to show, but I think we could probably come up with a carrier is live. We'll show you that data, and then when they're 100, um, percent so we know that once we start in earnest, which should be June, it's probably gonna take us close to a year to get through this 100. Uh, percent We know that. So that's just kind of where we are. Mm -hmm. Fair enough, Paul. Mm -hmm. That that's what I've talked to them about because of how much data and information there is, finding a way to display this in a concise manner for a board like this is tough, but we'll we'll provide whatever the board wants. We'll, we'll do our best to get that data because we know visibility into that is is kind of what, you know, or you you guys are asking of us. Yeah, it makes sense. I, I think just for, for me, when you say, uh, right, uh, we now have a piece app who's migrated, but if they're live with just T-Mobile, that to me, that doesn't seem like, um, it's fully migrated because you're going to run into issues with each carrier you bring up, right? So when you when you say we're going to migrate, you know, three PSAPs, five PSAPs, that's the point where I'm, I'm just I think that it needs to be a little more transparent as to like, you know, what is truly live, what's not. So Paul, maybe what you can do at the branch level. We've learned that when one carrier goes live with a provider, there's some lessons learned. As you go live with more carriers, can you report out at the next meeting what new things you're learning? In other mm -hmm. words, when you flip the switch with T-Mobile and the central region at PSAP number one, when you get to PSAP number four, are you encountering anything new that you didn't learn? Or is it just literally flip the switch, validate everything's working and you move on? Do the same thing with each carrier. Track that, especially down to the engineering level. So then we'll have a confidence that as we bring on another carrier at another PSAP, the only problems we expect to encounter is something that was missed with CPE programming at the PSAP. That, that's the only detail we're expecting. Location already works because it's already going over next gen for location. 
We've already migrated that carrier with another PSAP. Wouldn't expect anything new there. So just a CPE programming issue at that point. The other thing we've learned is that each PSAP looks at different things and what's on your screen as a dispatcher that's critically important to you, the next PSAP doesn't even look at it. And so that will be the other anomaly that we think we'll uncover. So let's track that and see if literally when we cut PSAP by PSAP, nothing new, nothing exciting, totally boring, just flip the switch and away they went. Mm -hmm. And we'll get that for you in the August board meeting. So we'll have some go lives between now and then. Okay, thank you. Yeah. All right. All right, any other comments from the board on that? Okay, go ahead. All right. Uh, the next item for us to cover is cloud CPE. And again, great news story. Um, we have uh, Intrado, Carbine, AT&T Intrado, and AT&T Carbine are now completed with all NG911 lab validation. Um, we have Motorola and AT&T Motorola. Uh, AT&T is partnered with Motorola to be a, a reseller. Um, they are, are still in lab. They're uh, working through some network connectivity issues, um, but we expect them uh, to be completed here soon. Um, so huge news for us. We now have uh, seven options for cloud CPE currently available today, and we expect a couple more. Uh, and we have Lumen, uh, who is um, starting the lab validation process with uh, uh, Motorola as well. So we'll, uh, as soon as they get uh, further along in the testing, we'll start reporting out on the Lumen solution. I'm sorry, just a question. Is that a newer Lumen solution or because they've already made it through the lab? No. So Lumen made it through with uh, micro automation. They had also signed up to be a reseller of Motorola. So they're going through uh, to validate Motorola reseller as well. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So one of the big questions that has uh, come up uh, previously uh, is that connectivity to existing uh, cloud CPE vendors. Uh, so here is a quick graphic we built uh, reflecting that network that is in place and ready uh, to go live in the field. Uh, the top column is Autos as the next gen core service provider connecting into the Autos Gemma solution, the Entrado solution, and Carbine. All of those connections are complete and those systems are ready to go live with Autos as the network service provider. And then in uh, the case of NGA 911 being the next gen service provider, um, NGA has network with their solution, uh, Intrado and Carbine. Um, so for Central and LA region, anybody uh, purchasing any of those systems can get those systems installed and go live uh, today. Um, we're working with the other next gen uh, core service providers to complete the network um, testing and uh, uh, installation and testing. Uh, when we did our contracts, we developed what we call a, a project milestone report. And the purpose of this um, report is a uh, it's a document that validates that we've had a conversation with the vendor and established an expectation, uh, a performance metric or clarifying something in the contract. And in the contract, we have an, a service level agreement tied to that um, project deployment plan milestone. So what we've done is we've issued all of our next gen core service providers, a project milestone report with a delivery date of Monday, May 20th, to have all of this network in place. If they can't get the network in place by Monday, May 20th, we will start issuing service level agreement letters uh, to those vendors and uh, request remittance of $5,000 per day for each day that they miss that targeted milestone. Uh, we've been meeting with them. All of the vendors are pushing to get this, um, and we will uh, see what happens Monday afternoon. A question on this. Again, not a loaded question. I don't know the answer yeah. to this. Um, when you list in Toronto and Carbine, does, does that include their resellers as well? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, the resellers are doing everything exact as the manufacturer. They're just taking and, and literally 
taking everything from those manufacturers and going in and installing them, maintaining. Yes. So just to confirm, if you're in the central or LA region at this point and you've signed up with one for the cloud CPE, the clock has started? Yes. When does the clock officially start? Uh, it's live now. Okay. Yeah. So at this point, NGA or Atos or Carbide, any of these carriers have 90 days now yeah. to uh, bring up the test solution for these PSAPs that have signed agreement. So we're working with NGA currently in the lab. Um, going through a recertification of their CPE. They've made some um, adjustments to the CPE. So Brian and his team are working with them. Um, and as soon as all of that testing and validation has occurred, then NGA stop clock will be lifted. Okay, and do you have an anticipated date on that or target date? No, um, I got an update this morning. Um, the engineering team met with the NGA team this morning um, and they're working through some uh, last uh, technical uh, requirements, but no, timeline was established. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. So because of our uh, network connectivity with Cloud CPE, uh, we have not had any um, system acceptance uh, completed for 2024. Um, I will share Wasco PD did go live with the uh, NGE, uh, NGA uh, Cloud cloud call handling solution. Um, they went live two months ago, um, six weeks ago about. Um, I don't believe that they've signed system acceptance. I, I think they're still going through some of those uh, configurations. They were a new PSAP, um, so it wasn't a replacement of a system. So um, they did test. Uh, and are a part of the uh, successful team in the Kern County. So they're expecting uh, next gen 911 traffic as soon as we're able to green light the other five PSAPs. Our uh, legacy CPE, this number continues to grow. This is a conversation that we have uh, regularly with Janae and Andrew. Um, we're up to 228. Uh, PSAPs that have equipment that's seven years or older. Um, we meet regular with our cloud CPE providers and our NGCS providers, and we continue to share this number because this is this is our critical information. Um, why we need that network connectivity to all of those cloud CPE providers, so we can get those cloud CPE providers out and hitting these. Um, specifically the year 8, 9, 10, and 11 PSAPs to get that replacement as soon as possible. Ultimately, um, we want 100% through the state, um, but we understand that that's going to be multiple years for us to go out and, and replace every PSAP in the state. Fiscal and operational review, another good news story for us, uh, as we've briefed in previous board meetings, our advisory and compliance team um, had been uh, hit pretty hard with uh, some promotions and uh, resignations, and Janae has been working very hard. She's got five full-time employees. Uh, she was down to one full-time employee. And I'm proud to say that as of the first week of June, she will have five full time employees. Um, two of her uh, team uh, are on board and have been training. Um, they've been getting more engaged with the PSAPs and learning their job. Um, the other two come on board in June. Uh, she's got a great training plan, and we expect that as soon as the two new are onboarded, the two other folks are um, sure-footed enough in their position that they're going to start the fiscal and operational review process and taking these new team members out, getting them in the field, getting them introduced to the PSAPs. So um, the fiscal and operational review number, you'll see climb when we report out in August. And definitely in the February meeting in 2025, we expect that number to be uh, a lot larger. Um, and again, we want to focus those PSAPs that are on this previous slide here with this legacy CPE 
make sure that they're educated, make sure that they have the information and understand their role in selecting a CPE provider and make sure that we are there to support them in that um, decision making. And then here is a placeholder uh, slide. These are the points of contact for uh, Janae's advisory and compliance uh, team. Uh, we don't have the telephone numbers or email addresses of those new employees. Assume and put information up there that may not be accurate. So as soon as they're onboarded, we'll get this slide updated and their points of contact will be updated on our org chart that's posted on the Cal OES website. But we're super excited to get them onboarded here in uh, June and uh, get Janae out and her team out there um, getting back engaged with all of the PSAPs. Uh, I saw you taking a picture. We'll, we'll post these slides on, on the website after the meeting. Um, all right, take a quick pause here for any uh, questions about uh, CPE. All right. Statewide staffing study. So all of our data has been collected. The uh, Promethean 1 team and 911 Authority team, they also had uh, 911 Authority was doing the staffing study portion of this contract. Promethean 1 was doing another network analysis uh, for our, our radio and uh, microwave shop uh, across the way here. So far, we've got 695 surveys that were um, responded to from the line level call taker dispatcher and 64 surveys that were uh, responded to by PSAP management. Um, in a 10% is our target to get a, a good data set, and we've got 14% um, received from PSAP management. Uh, the current the uh, data is currently being evaluated. They are drafting the uh, initial report. We expect delivery by the end of this month. Um, 911 Authority did advise me um, they are finding some interesting differences um, between the perception of management and line level dispatchers. Kind of ironic, right? Um, one of the examples they shared is 65.2% uh, of their call takers dispatchers report uh, management as the cause for people leaving, whereas PSAP management reported uh, that they felt that only occurred in 5% of the cases. Um, again, from industry, I think anecdotally, We've heard this over and over, um, and I think this survey, this report will help us validate some of that anecdotal understanding that we've had. Um, one of the largest reasons uh, the dispatchers um, was determining factors in leaving um, was mental health and wellness which um, I think there's been a lot of attention over the last few years. I think this survey and this study will allow uh, for us to bring more attention to this and allow managers and executives at these agencies to really identify that and hopefully put some um, policies and some programs in place to help uh, the dispatchers out with that aspect. Quick pause for any questions on the uh, staffing study. Maybe even more of a comment, but I appreciate the last uh, bullet point because I know that there was state funding that came to agencies based on sworn size and the funding was specific for sworn wellness and did not include dispatch. So it's nice to see that this might lead to additional funding for agencies that might not be able to afford it. So. Right. Right. Thank you. Um, we were working closely with um, post. They they had. Uh, a manager, one over there who was in charge of the dispatch training. She recently um, took a job um, outside in the private sector. They're backfilling that position. When that's backfilled, we'll, we'll reach out and create a relationship there. Um, but Jennifer, when she was there, was tracking this and was very interested in receiving a copy of this so she could work with the post leadership um, to embed this in some of the programs and trainings that they have. Um, and then recently, Calnina hosted, Calnina and the uh, uh, Northern and Southern California APCO chapters hosted a uh, legislative day here in Sacramento. And a, a couple of the teams, when they were working with their local 
legislative representatives or staff, they talked about the staffing study that OES is doing. And we've gotten a lot of interest in um, our legislative representatives and their staff. They want a copy of this report when it's finalized so they can see the impacts and continue this discussion of um, how should we classify uh, public safety dispatchers and, and what support can they give us. So we're excited about this and, the, and I think the findings will be very helpful. All right, uh, here's our set in a fun condition uh, statement. Very difficult to read on this slide. It's a little easier when you pull it up on your computer. This is available online through Department of Finance website. Um, we will start the uh, set in a rate process here in June. Uh, we'll initiate communication out to all of the access line providers um, and we'll start to do the data collection that will be due to us in August when we get that um, number. Um, the budget will be finalized. We'll input all of that data into our spreadsheet. And we'll start to calculate what we believe that setting a rate uh, should be. And um, once that work is done, then we get a letter out to our director, um, get that reviewed signature, and then we send that over to uh, uh, CDTFA and Department of Finance uh, by uh, October 1st. So that work will be going in the August meeting. We should be able to brief what our initial findings are and uh, how we're drafting uh, the set and the rate uh, to look for uh, calendar year 25. I had a, a question. If you go back one slide. The. Um, <clears throat> The telephone user surcharge revenue. What can you, I think you might have covered this before, but what was a big drop? It goes from three sixty eight and then down to one eighty four five one four and one eighty four five one four two years in a row. Twenty. Yeah. Yeah. So we asked Department of Finance about that. Um, those revenues in the fund that wasn't a drop. What you saw was a spike in twenty one twenty two. And the 184 is what we would expect to see based on the surcharge. So what that means is that the the fund has a, a comfortable reserve uh, if they call it for economic uncertainties. If you look at the bottom there uh, where we're carrying that balance. Um, so that's that's good news that the fund ha is healthy uh, and this fund is protected the uh, by a couple of different ways. There's only specific things the fund can be used for. And also by FCC rules, there's additional restrictions on what this can be used for. So we're looking, we're we're in a very healthy spot, the healthiest we've ever been. And so we're uh, really excited that the revenue is there to support what we need going forward. So as you're tracking what's going on with the California state budget, this fund is what's called the special fund. And uh, we've got the resources we need to be successful and uh, really, that's the uh, thanks to what everybody in, on this board and everybody in the audience and participating online has done to get this dedicated surcharge in place for 911. Just a follow up question. I know in 2324, the expenditures exceed the revenue, so it's dipping down the reserve. Um, is that expected to continue? So, no, um, but. Obviously, carrying two systems at the same time is the challenge. The longer we keep legacy around, the more that we tap into those reserves that you see for economic uncertainty. So that's one of the challenges I've been mm -hmm. pushing Paul on quite hard mm -hmm. is let's get transitioned so we can stop paying for that legacy stuff uh, and move into this next gen environment. In kind of trailing back to Budge's point there, when we get a uh, 12 Omni Imperial 100% cut, then those selective routers, although two, we we can decommission them. We, once we validate traffic is 100% off that selective router, and little by little, we'll start to see uh, savings trickle in. Uh, and when we get to report that, I will have a huge slide, big, bright slide, So again, here's the uh, outline of our uh, uh, setting a fee process. Um, the the fee was originally set at 30 cents. 
and it's expected to stay at 30 cents. Um, we do have some work uh, going on uh, with with the uh, governor's budget that we'll be able to report out in August uh, if if the budget is all approved and everything goes through. So super excited about that. Um, we've been able to maintain um, a, a good standard of living in the 911 ecosystem with the budget and all of the great work that was done to change this fee. Any other questions? All right, so that concludes the 911 uh, brief update for item number six. Any questions from the board as a follow up? I just one. Uh, <clears throat> kind of overall picture with the NG project. I know for the last few years we've been getting the updates and I don't want to sit here and oversimplify it, but I am just curious. Is there anything that the board can do to help your folks like get it moving along? I know we've heard different things like strike teams and this and that. Like, is it a money thing? Or I, I know we don't have much authority really here other than to recommend, but it just seems like when you look at the slide with the um, older systems, granted, obviously they're working right now, but for the public at large in California, I mean, I know it's a highly complex project. Um, like, is a one time allotment of money, would that help? really push everything forward or are we just at the mercy of an incredibly complex transition? So when you asked your question, I, I thought of an idea. What may help both you as a board member and you representing your professional association. Um, if you contacted our vendors and expressed your concerns over the status that we have now, Budge and I meet with them every other week. Um, <clears throat> good meetings, but the meetings are, are pretty much the same every other week to every other week. Um, I think hearing somebody's outside perspective of the importance of getting this work done may be helpful. So my ask of the board members and in the professional association specifically um, is to do some outreach to our vendors and express your concerns, especially when we look at this you know, 228 PSAPs with equipment that's seven years or older. Um, you know, you, if you have a chief or sheriff who's calling and saying, my system's 12, and I, I want to, my team's buying, but I can't deploy because of your inaction. I, I think that would be helpful. Um, I don't think money is the issue. You know, we we have money and, and we are able to pay the bills. The, the vendors are invoicing us for the work that is getting done. Um, I think now we're, I think we're literally close. Um, the Promethean 1 911 Authority team has been huge being able to get into the technical, technical stuff where our team has been so busy coordinating so much. Um, that they've given our team very specific data that's been buried in minutia and our team's pushing to get little wins. So I, I think we're right at, we're 100 meters from the top of Everest. We just have this little, this little push. Um, but I, I hope that answers your question. And um, we can definitely share that contact information uh, with our vendor leadership uh, to ask you know, both from the board and the professional associations to do some outreach. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I think the other thing I continually ask the team is, you know, the feedback you're getting, is this to make the system perfect and to imagine all of your dreams? Or is this something you actually need in order to, you know, do your job? And And it's difficult to discern some of those sometimes. The new system is different, but we appreciate that. Um, there's going to be a change. So if you want it to behave exactly like the old, inadequate, outdated, constantly failing system you have today, it's not going to work that way. And it's really tough for us to differentiate the two of those kinds of feedback. And they're both important. So that would be helpful too. Like as you get, but as you talk to um, police chief, sheriffs, fire chiefs, those managing these dispatch centers, help us understand what kind of feedback is this is. Is this feedback of, oh my goodness, I'm terrified for the transition, please help me through it. What does this new screen mean? Or is this, this is not working and broken and it's going to impact how I do my day-to-day -day job. That would be really helpful for us for us too. Um, and, and we have a hard time differentiating between the two, especially me, never been a dispatcher. 
um, you know, I'm I'm like, wait a minute, now what's this real problem? Okay, yeah, I know it's over there on the screen, but now it's here, it's still there. Like, let's train everybody and realize, don't look there, look here, or is this, it's just missing and wrong. And I, I think that's part of, of what we're seeing as well. There's a lot of apprehension out there. Uh, one additional question. So it seems like based on your, the plan of uh, uh, Promethean One and the 9 authority that the central region and provider, you have some confidence in them based on how you're rolling this out. Do you have any update on Lumen or Synergym? Uh, Lumen is working. Um, they're going through the same efforts in the southern region. In parallel, they're also focused on transitioning alley emulation services. They've got a few PSAPs that they had to push through. Um, alley circuits go away. The legacy alley circuit goes away in June. It's no longer supported, no longer available. Um, so there's a huge push to get all of that legacy alley replaced. Um, so we've given Lumen their number one task is to get alley emulation in every PSAP in the region. Number two task is testing. Um, they are meeting our testing um, schedule. They did Redondo, uh, Redondo Beach yesterday afternoon. Um, they've got, uh, I think, three PSAPs that they're focused on. Um, they are looking at Orange County to be their first county to go um, through this process and start to migrate traffic. Um, and we continue to work with Synergym. We're, we're focusing efforts to learn right now. And we're working with Synergym uh, to get some um, corrections and get everything set for their PSAPs. Um, so once we get lessons learned out of Central and a couple in Southern, then we're gonna start to focus on the 169 PSAPs up North. Okay, thank you. All right, any other questions uh, on item number six, uh, number five? All right, any questions from the public on item number five or online? All right, thank you, Mr. Troxville, I appreciate it. All right, so the next item, if you're tracking numerically, is item number six. However, we're gonna go back because we skipped an item uh, as a, a member that requested this was uh, not physically in the room yet. I'm not calling you out, Mark, but welcome aboard. Um, so I'm going to go back to item number three. Well, which is going to take me a million clicks. However, uh, this is closed session. So the way that closed session works is slightly different due to some updates in Bagley Keen and some of the rules that have been changed. So uh, at the end of the last meeting, uh, one of the board members uh, requested going into closed session. We ran out of time. We said that we would table that and come back to this meeting and, and go into closed session. So the way it works is we'll need a motion to go into closed session. We take a vote. If we have a majority, then we'll step away into closed session. Um, we'll conduct closed session. And then based on the rules, what's discussed there, we'll then return back and report out the good notes for those in the room. You'll get a little break while we step away and go into closed session, but we will be back. So if there's still a desire to go into closed uh, session to discuss that outage measure uh, we talked about last meeting, I'll entertain a motion. I move. All right, so surprise, surprise, Mark makes a move that we go into closed session. Do we have a second? second. All right, I'll do a roll call uh, vote here. Uh, so Mark Chase. Aye. Chief White. Aye. Kurt Wallace. Uh, Sheriff Braun online. Yes. All right. Chief Ramirez online. Yes. And I believe Chief Ellison, you joined us as well. Is that correct, sir? Yes. All right. Uh, Demetrius. Aye. And Chief uh, Gonzalez. Aye. All right. So we have a unanimous vote. So we will go into closed session. Um, and when we're done, we will come back and report out. So we will move to another location. We will have some staff guide us in that direction and we'll return shortly.
All right, thank you. Um, and uh, we're going to come back from closed session. Um, so for those board members that are online, please make sure your cameras are on and uh, that you can hear me. Uh, so if one of you could just let me know that the audio is working two ways again and we're ready to go. Yep, we're good there. OK, so we did go into closed session. Uh, we discussed a um, an outage that that had some security implications to it. And we talked through some of the testing and mitigation that we're doing as a branch to make sure that the corrective actions that we were, were directed have been implemented and uh, we're tracking that. And, uh, you know, that's one of the advantages we have of of having our laboratory upstairs and able to test these types of solution and as close to a real environment as, as possible. Um, it also highlights the importance of making sure that the PSAPs understand how to report outages, how to quickly get a hold of the 911 branch so that we can work through these issues. So with that, I'll see if there's any questions from the public on what we covered in closed session. Ad ad admittedly, we won't be able to say much, but uh, I'll open it up to questions from the public. All right, hearing none, I think we're on item number six on the agenda, which is going to take a few clicks for me to get to. And that is an update on the statewide 988 call handling solution and customer relationship management software uh, that is in support of our 988 system. We have a full board meeting on this tomorrow. And so that meeting will probably take a little over two hours. So if you want additional information, you can either attend that meeting tomorrow, which is publicly available and there's a link there, or wait until the video is posted and, and then watch it at your leisure. I'll give you a quick update on where we are. Um, we have completely tested out with Vibrant. They are the uh, National Lifeline Administrator working in um, collaboration with the uh, Substance Abuse and, and Mental Health Services Agency at the federal level. Uh, and they are the ones that deliver the 90 day calls, chats and texts um, to California and to every state. We validated that we're compliant with all those workflows, which was a huge step on our part. We also validated that anything that are required in terms of reporting, we're able to meet all of that. And um, our next step is to get approval from SAMHSA to begin a phased approach to roll that technology out to the centers. Once we start that approval process, it takes about six months to finish the deployment to the 12 98 centers that are in California. There's some huge advantages of here. And for this community, the uh, 911 community, it really is going to allow us to bring those 98 calls into 911 as a 911 call. So you won't receive them on your um, non-emergency line. They'll actually come in as a priority 911 call and with as much information as is available from the 98 system. Uh, keeping in mind, they don't have the same location accuracy that you've got in 911. And we're working on some of the policies and procedures now and how we move those calls back and forth. Jeff Abair from San Diego um, County is chairing a, a working group on on that and there's representation from 91 and 98 to work through those workflows. So that's what's happening with that piece. In addition, um, we're working on 98 uh, mobile dispatch technology to be able to dispatch mobile crisis teams in response to uh, mental health and um, and uh, other uh, situations like that that don't require law enforcement or medical response. We released that RFP. There were some um, procurement um, things we had to fix. We canceled that RFP. We're going to re-release that, and we still expect to be able to sign the contract by the end of the summer of 2024, and that will provide the technology to do mobile dispatch that works in concert with the call handling solution and the, the CRM that's out there now. So that's a quick update of where we are um, with 988. Any any questions from the board uh, related to 988? I just have a question. So on the mobile dispatch portion of that, so the vision would be each of the 12 centers has some type of a dispatch component to be able to dispatch their own uh, non-law enforcement, non-fire resources? So Mark, if you'd asked me that question a year ago, I would have said, yeah, that's certainly that's how it's gonna work. However, Dispatching is a completely different skill set from answering the 988 call. And you could imagine, you know, in the 988 world, different from 911, 
they're literally helping the person from beginning to end when they take that call. And there's licensed clinicians that are trained in this skill set. Um, and dispatching is a completely different skill set. So we're learning that there are some centers who may answer yes to that question. Yes, we want to do our dispatch and others that are saying no. It'd probably be better if we could find someone else to dispatch for us. The good news is that question doesn't impact the technology. Who dispatches is an important question that we will one day answer, but the technology is what we're focused on now. So we wrote the RFP in such a way that we don't specify who exactly is going to be doing the dispatch. We focus on the functional requirements that you need to have in place in order to dispatch. Um, things like pulling the information from the 9 and 8 call handling system, interfacing with the counselor that's got the person on the phone that needs this mobile crisis response. That's what the RFP focuses on. Uh, additional conversation will have to be had on who will actually do the dispatch. Um, we've had internal conversations about who that would be, and we're going to have to go center by center to have those relationships um, developed to see who would do the dispatch. Personally, Obviously, this workflow is very similar to way to the way fire and EMS is dispatched. So that might make sense to find some regional, you know, fire EMS folks that are willing to do that dispatch on behalf of 988, but we haven't worked out all those details. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Long answer to a short question. Sorry. <laughs> all right. Uh, any other questions from the board on that, either in the room or online? All right. Any questions from the public on this? Okay, moving on to agenda. I up. Oh, yes, we do have a question. Can you can you come to a mic? You have to say who you are, but we just want to be able to make sure the people online can hear you. Is it the state's obligation to determine who is dispatching the resources for the mental health teams handling these nine eight eight calls? So. Obligation would be a difficult question to ask, but certainly Cal OES on the technology side, Cal HHS, um, the Health and Human Services Agency for the state, and DHCS, the Department, what is the Department of Healthcare Services for the state, are all working together to figure out the policy procedures and technology that needs to be in place. And it's through that process that we'll answer this question. So I guess the short answer to your question is probably yes, but through a variety of processes that are underway. And then you had a, a comment. Oh, OK. All right. Thank you. Anyone else in the room? Am I missing any other hands? Anybody else online? OK. No. All right. Um, so a little bit more if you want uh, the, the technical details on this. If you want to go dig into government code to get the answer to your own question, I've got the reference to the government code up there. Um, and really, one of the things it requires is that no later than July, we've got to validate interoperability. We've done a lot of work in our lab to validate that that interoperability is in place. That idea of being able to move that call from 911 to 988 uh, and vice versa, following the all the standards that are in place, we validated that. And again, um, we issued the certificates about that. The next step is to be able to roll this technology out to our center. So we're really excited about trying to take that next step. And that's what consumes a, a large part of my time is working through those last set of agreements. Um, I think this might be a duplicate slide. Um, and again, if you want to look at what our requirements are for our Cal OES in reference to government code, I've got these here for your reference. I'm certainly not going to read through them. All right, moving on to item number seven. Uh, I know that the long range planning committee met yesterday, and I think we've got um, Alicia, are you online and going to brief out? All right, so I'm looking in the room. Is it Casey? Is it? Jeff, Casey's going to brief out. All right. So come on up and brief out uh, Long Range Planning Committee, and we welcome to, to hear how the, the what the committee's doing. Thank you. Um, so Cal OES also provided LRPC with the staffing study update. Um, we plan to hold a July meeting to discuss the findings and uh, possible actionable routes to assist PSAPs with recruitment and retention. 
Um, we're also working on a document for PSAPs that addresses policy-based routing. What we're finding is there's kind of a general lack of understanding in PSAPs around what is policy-based routing and what capabilities it provides. Uh, the document will explain policy-based routing, provide some history, provide scenarios in which alternate routing can be used in times of disaster or other outages, and also uh, based on discipline, law, fire, EMS. So we plan to uh, have that document to present in our July meeting, and we hope that it bridges the gap and assists PSAPs in selecting options for routing or alternate routing. Um, our other project is also addressing regionalization and exploring incentive options, meaning incentives for PSAPs that are bringing additional agencies in and also those individual departments that may be eliminating their local PSAP or some of that control, how do we incentivize those chiefs or sheriffs to kind of give up some of that control and regionalize? So there was some discussion around, could we provide funding to assist them in purchasing technology and purchasing equipment, or even uh, funding to return to partners to assist with cost allocation? Um, and we hope to provide that timeline in our July meeting. And that's the end of my report. All right, so a couple of interesting topics. Any comments from the board? No one wants to touch the hot potato no. of, of regionalization. <laughs> it's a hot topic in my camp. <laughs> All right, uh, any any other questions or comments from the board? Go ahead, Chief White. I would just say, um, I sit on the Kletz Advisory Board and um, we just had the whole discussion about basically uh, dealing with disaster recovery and so forth. So I think the timing of this is great. And I think it'd be one that would be worthwhile to bring back to here and present just to talk generally about like what's available or what the future systems bring um, in dealing with it. Because I think there's a lot of capabilities, but in the midst of a, a problem occurring, we don't always think of what's out there. So both pre-planning and then if it happens, like who you call, what resources you can get um, now and with the future technology. So thanks for all the work you guys. Thank you, and I think you're right. It's gonna be a real benefit um, moving away from the manual flip of the switch to this is happening, the policy is just going to automatically reroute my calls where I need them to go. So um, there's a lot of talk about this at the federal level too. I don't know how many of you have heard the acronym PACE, primary, alternate, contingency, emergency, and having a plan for each of those scenarios. And so obviously the primary is what we all work to every single day. Most of us probably consider an alternate. Maybe we've tested it once in our career, but the other two, you know, the contingency and emergency, we probably don't consider much. So maybe that's something that uh, we can explore to, to start gathering information from our PSAPs to figure out if they in fact have a PACE plan and what is it. Um, I think we'll probably get the deer in the headlights look from many of them. Um, but that's, I think that's an important part of this conversation, Chief, because once we solve the fact that we can move a call anywhere in the state, which we're actively moving toward, okay, how do we address the shortfalls in CAD, which is the next thing, because once the call gets there, you'd like to actually be able to dispatch somebody. And then to dispatch someone, you typically need a radio system, so how do we you know, address that as well? So all three of those become important, and there are some things that the state is doing to address those through the data sharing uh, a contract that we have out for CAD to CAD and through our statewide radio system that we have, there are some opportunities to finally solve this at scale. So I think that'll be an important part of the conversation for what you're doing on the LRPC. All right. Okay, any questions from the comment or comments from the public on agenda item number seven? All right, seeing, hearing none. Thank you, Casey. Appreciate it. All right, item eight is uh, to um, address, uh, to give the board an opportunity to have any specific assignments that you'd like to provide to the LRPC. We keep this as a stand standing agenda item, and so um, entertain anything from the board of additional things that you want the LRPC to look at. I just know I brought up uh, best practices for dispatching at home, and uh, we brought that up once before. So I just I'm still interested in seeing what the thoughts are from the LRPC on what technology would be required, what standards 
might be used what occurred during the pandemic, right? What agencies were successfully dispatching at home, just in case, you know, the state obviously uh, were subject to a lot of different natural natural disasters. So it would be um, a timely topic. All right, so I see head nods from the LRPC members in the room. They'll add that to the list and uh, that'll be something they could start talking about in July. Thank you, Mark. All right, any other? Oh, go yeah, ahead. One that I don't want it to be a nightmare, so I apologize ahead of time, but um, with the difficulty of getting staffing, and I think all of the centers are in desperation for qualified members to join their teams, um, what that could look like is there a best practice for, for minimums or safe numbers for, for centers. I know we're all very different. I'm a regional team, so we have the ability to hop on different radios and different systems as needed, but for those that are not, is there... Is there something we can be looking at for their benefit? What their minimums are that they could then take to their bosses for staffing and full time equivalent numbers for budgets. And I think that's part of the work of the staffing study. So once that staffing study is out and we really identify some of these gaps, what the state is asking is. How can we help? And that's what started this this study. And I think if one of the ways we can help is to put out some minimums in terms of this is what is required for staffing. We've already established minimums for call answer time, and we've seen some ability to help at the local level to say, hey, look, we're supposed to be answering, you know, I think was it 90% in 15 seconds or less? Is that the current standard? Um, and you're at 65%. Um, here's your letter, please come in compliance. Then that goes to your board, gives you all the power at the local level to say, hey, I need five more PYs to meet this requirement. If we could go one step further, perhaps, and say for this call volume, this is the recommended staffing level. Um, I think that's something that that we could do, and and we can work with the LRPC to kind of get those minimum staffing level recommendations, and they're all based on Erlang C calculations and everything else. It's known data that we can put out there. It's just a matter of vetting it through the LRPC back to the state. Okay. So sort of staffing level recommendations is what I'm hearing. OK. Anything else from the board? Yes, absolutely. Yes. It's a public meeting. We invite sharing. This is, yeah. Sorry, I just wanted to make a comment. We we did that in my county with the, we actually requested the letter because we had not met standards. In fact, we had not met standards since ECAT's data started coming into the center, but our staffing always remained the same. So it was a helpful tool to bring that letter and say, hey, for Cal OES. And then we also use the ECAT staffing forecast and the reporting to say this is the recommended you know, number of staffing and um, my board took action on it. So we were able to add out nine more call taker allocations because of that. So I just wanted to, anybody out there that's listening, let them know that it is a helpful tool. A success story. Wow. I, so for the record, Cal OES was helpful. That That's what I heard. One, one, that's one. We were helpful. Yes. Uh, and that's really the work that Janae and her team does um, is, is to provide that insight. Uh, we try and be very careful to never do those kinds of things without talking directly to the center manager. But um, we can certainly be helpful as a resource to tie this kind of data together in a way that you can present it to your board. OK, any other comments uh, or additions from the board on this? Any questions or comments from the public on item number eight? All right. Item number nine is um, agenda items for future meetings. The standing items we have in this agenda will obviously be um, coming forward to the next meeting in August. But is there anything else that members of the board would like to see added to the next meeting? All right, seeing, hearing none, sort of the drop dead timeline for us. We prepare our agenda about 45 days out. So beginning of July is your sort of end of time to have a good idea for that agenda. If it's critical, we obviously can adjust, but we've got to post the agenda 10 days prior, um, and that's a legislative requirement. So just keep in mind if something does come up, that you'd like for us to address. Um, certainly that 10 day window is what's critical. 
we do have the ability to call an emergency meeting. We've done it once in the history of me being here. Um, so we do we can do that. Keep that in mind as something that is available, but it, it does take some some challenges to put that together. All right, so the board and uh, shows our next meeting in August and the one after that in November. All right, now we're at the point where I'll ask um, the board members for anything to comment on that wasn't on the agenda. We'll start with the board members. Anything we didn't talk about that we shouldn't have or something that you want to bring up for the good of the order? OK, uh, I look to members of the public, both in the room and online for any public comment on anything that was on the agenda or that wasn't. Um, we'll open it up to public comment. Give a long, uncomfortable pause for anybody online. All right, seeing, hearing none. All right, last agenda item. Adjourn. Do we have a motion to adjourn? Said motion. All right, thank you, Chief Gonzalez. We have a second? Second. Second for Mark. All right, we are adjourned. I appreciate your time and thank you very much.